and, and, and so forth. You might notice that there's a slight um, change to both the title and, and uh, of this talk, and, and particularly the author. Uh, I'm not a Filipino, uh, but my uh, co-author on this paper, Angel Alcala, certainly is. He's my um, uh, work partner for the last 25 years, and this is really largely his story. And uh, I guess I could say I've, I've basked in the reflected glory of the great man for, for about a quarter of a century. Um, why implement marine no-take reserves? If you're in the room, you can uh, go to sleep for about one slide because you read this last night, particularly conservation. Why, why do people set things up like this? Uh, in terms of um, uh, conservation, no-take areas often generate uh, alternative incomes, uh, particularly from tourism, and it's the sort of thing that stakeholders can, can see really quickly and take advantage of relatively quickly. Uh, the other one, particularly in develop, developing nations like the Philippines, uh, fisheries management is a major focus of why people set up no-take reserves uh, for their potential fishery benefits in the long term, becoming uh, net exporters of, uh, of, of fish biomass out to fished areas. I'm going to talk um, about the Philippines and particularly the, uh, the central Philippines. Just draw your attention to those little islands right at the top because I just realised this morning when I looked at this talk, I'm going to give a bit of context to this story and it relates a little bit to those two little islands uh, sitting up at the top of uh, Palawan there, which is a relatively remote part of the Philippines. <clears throat> Why uh, use no-take areas, permanent spatial closures to fishing as a fisheries management tool? The answer in developing nations is pretty straightforward. It's really hard to limit catch, effort, size limits, the sort of standard things we use in fisheries management. Uh, in addition to that, the targeting is pretty much right across the entire spectrum. Uh, just about every major reef fish family in, um, in, on a reef is a target and is eaten. Uh, as people know, the Philippines has a very bad, bad reputation for destructive fishing techniques, explosives and, and cyanide. Um, and you may be wondering why I've got those great big fishing boats at the back when I'm talking about subsistence fishing on coral reefs in the Philippines. Those are industrial scale reef fishing boats. I took that photo in 1993 uh, and they are, they are boats that are about two to three hundred tonnes. They have about two or three hundred kids on board. The kids are put in the water with a little bamboo float. The bamboo float has a, a, a rope on it with a coral rock that bashes under the coral, pushes um, uh, fish towards a big bag net and catches pretty well everything. You can see Sean Connolly's sharks and uh, Dave Bellwood's parrotfish and my, my uh, um, groupers and Morgan Pratchett's ketodontids. Everything is there, so it's a very effective thing. Um, and that's the context that, that, that was dealing with, particularly in the 70s and 80s uh, in, in the Philippines. Uh, and no-take reserves were one of the few options that, the, that people could see as a, as a potential management tool because the locals could actually see some benefits, particularly, uh, as I said, from tourism. And that's a key part of this uh, story. I wanted to give you a bit of context uh, and a bit of personal experience on this about how, um, how, how the situation has changed over the years. Um, many years ago I was invited to that same fish market uh, by one of my students to go and see one of the fisheries that they were developing in that little island that I just pointed to up in northern Palawan, the F Philippine Fisheries Development Authority. Come along Gary, you'll see some really good stuff. I thought, yeah, okay, this will be interesting. What I saw absolutely amazed me. I'd been working on this species in Australia for three or four years. It's an inshore coral trout, the exact same species that uh, Jeff Jones and Dave Williamson and I and, and others are going to be marking with uh, barium uh, down in the Keppels. But I hadn't seen coral trout this size ever in my life. I'd published papers on this uh, the year before, and this was some of the biggest coral trout I'd ever seen of this species, and there was proverbial truckloads of them. The thing that struck me was this was probably one of the first times I'd ever seen a, almost an unfished stock of coral trout. What was the response of these guys? Uh, they took out an Asian Development Bank loan and they uh, built a fleet of 300 boats, uh, not too dissimilar to these ones here, with four lionfishes on board. That's 1,200 lionfishes. Talking to Bridget Kerrigan last night, that's bigger than the entire hook and line fleet on the entire Great Barrier Reef to go and catch these coral trout on those two little islands in the northern Palawan. Completely incommensurate, the, 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 the size of the fleet, completely incommensurate with the stock of fish there. But the point that I wanted to make is not that. The key point was that there was absolutely nothing illegal about it. In fact, it was actually encouraged by various governments all the way through the 70s and 80s that commercial fishing could come up to the fronts of reefs, your frontal, your village, and do that. And, and, um, and use drive net fishing and all, the, all those sorts of things. That's a key part of the story. Um, 
The, the work that I got involved with initially with Unghel Alcala starts way back in, in 1974, the establishment of two very tiny little no-take reserves, and they are tiny, I'll show, the, show them to you in a moment. Samillan was established in 1974, which predates the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act by a year, if you weren't in the room last night, uh, and APO in 1982. Um, these aren't quite the Great Barrier Reef. They're, um, they're pretty small, they're tiny. Uh, let's face it, three quarters of a kilometre of Samilon, 25% um, of the coral reef area. Uh, Apo, it's about uh, half, half a kilometre long, 10% of the coral reef area. Just note, though, that in 1974, some Philippine fishermen were willing to give up 25% of their fishing area. OK, so there's about 100, 100 or so fishers use both of these islands. Uh, they use standard fishing techniques, bamboo traps, hook and line, spear, and, uh, and um, gill nets. Um, the type of data I'm going to be talking about over the next few slides, I'll go through the biology pretty quickly, uh, is underwater visual census done by myself and fishery data collected by myself and my fishery colleagues. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is underwater visual census inside and outside the parks and fishery data inside and outside the parks over about a 20 to 25 year period as a, as a backdrop to uh, where this led to. Um, first question, do marine reserves pr pr produce more biomass? I'm going to use good old large predators, ceranids, lutejanids, lethronids, emperors, snappers and groupers. Samilon, the longer you protect them in the reserve, they go up. When you keep fishing them, they stay down. At Apo, over nearly 20 years, when you uh, fish them, they go up. When you uh, keep, keep uh, sorry, when you protect them, they go up. When you uh, keep fishing them, they stay down. And we had advantage uh, of a uh, large number of uh, other small reserves. That's temporal monitoring on the top, obviously. Um, where we could go to reserves of different ages and pretty much saw the same pattern, that the longer you protect things, you get more fish. Pretty basic stuff. But it was very important to go into the villages and talk about that sort of thing. Clearly, the, the local fishermen are really interested in if there's any connection between the, from those, those areas that, that recover and, um, and where they fish. This is some work done by a master student of mine, Rene Abbasamus, and it's a, par it's, uh, a surgeon fish, uh, naso eye, that thing there. Um, over about 20 years, um, inside the reserve, the black dots going up and up and up over about a 20-year period, the white dots are the, the, the controls, the, the, the fished areas. And it was actually evidence that over, after about nine to ten years, there was a bit of an asymptote in the, in the curve and it, it seemed, to, seemed to be almost flattening out over, a, over about a 20-year period. That's inside the reserve compared to outside. If you went outside the reserve, we noticed that um, there was a spatial bias developed through time such that there was a greater abundance of these things closer to than further away from the reserve and it developed through time. If you go fishing the either, either side of the edges of this reserve uh, with, uh, and you can catch surgeon fish with hook and line, I can guarantee you, uh, um, and catch these things, they are, they are bigger nearer the reserve and the catch rates are higher. So we were interested in, in whether uh, what sort of mechanism might sort of connect these things from the inside of the reserve to the outside. Hopped in the water, counted territorial interactions of these things. So uh, there's a naso blaming eye up here, and they're pretty aggressive. They bash each other up in regular intervals. And surprise, surprise, the interaction rates are about three or four times higher inside the reserve than outside. That's important because it actually explains a mechanism for why they might actually spill over to the outside and make themselves available. And I really quickly, um, change tack a fraction um, and show some data I haven't published yet um, to up update this talk a little. Uh, and it's the sort of things that conservationists rather than fisheries people are interested in. Do no-take reserves increase the numbers of species of things on reefs? And I'm going to use um, large predatory reef fish. And uh, at Sumilon, protect things for a long time, nearly 12 years. Yes, as you protect them, the, the control at APO, protected and, uh, and fished. That's kind of neat data. It sort of took me about 25 years to collect and it really pains me to say when I look at those graphs, as wonderful as they are, they're a little bit boring. Uh, Let's look at it in another way. Uh, if you went diving in 1983 at, uh, in Apo Reserve, uh, the numbers of, relative numbers of species of large predators you'd see was something like that. If you went diving there today, the relative numbers of species, this is not numbers or biomass, this is numbers of species, is 10 times higher, which is a fairly spectacular result, including up the top for the astute observers in the audience from the Great Barrier Reef, things like coral trout start turning up after a little while. Um, if you go outside the reserve uh, and look at um, the same variant, species richness of these things uh, at different distances away from the reserve, uh, initially there wasn't much spatial bias uh, between close to and farther from uh, the reserve. Uh, 
Um, after about 23 years, um, 200 to 500 metres out, you're getting about five times more species. This reflects a large number of things. Largely, they're fishing a lot less around the entire island. Go up a little closer to the edge of the reserve, the increase in numbers of species is twice as high. Now, that tends to suggest that there's possibly a little bit of communication uh, from the reserve to the non-reserve, but this is not numbers and biomass, it's numbers of species. I think it's one of the first demonstrations of a, of a reserve actually spilling over diversity or exporting ecosystems, all that sort of stuff that we kind of really get excited about, and it's, uh, uh, there, there it is, over a very short uh, distance, but uh, nevertheless um, a, a rather nice result. Um, now, Philippine fishers don't sample the water with a scuba tank on their back and a, a, a slate and a, and a pencil. They, get in, they sample it with fishing gears. And um, if you watch the behaviour of fishers, they know uh, that there are areas where there are lots of fish. Uh, this is Samilan Island Reserve. That's the boundary of the reserve there. Here's a protected area. These guys are fishing the line. I mean, they're, they're right up there, up, up there, trying to get the higher catch rates right near the edges. Commercial fishermen, prawn trawlers, do the same thing in, on the Great Barrier Reef. Scallop trawlers in the Grand George's Bank do exactly the same thing. Fishing the line, it, it's a, a very common thing. So we, we could observe the behaviour of the fishers. We could measure their catch rates and over spatial, uh, spatial areas. The black columns are near the reserve. The white columns are in the western and northern fishing grounds. So fishery catch rates were always higher at, at Apo Reserve um, and, but, and income rates were always higher. So that's a, another good a good sort of thing we could go to the fishermen and talk about. Um, finally, the critical thing, what do they do to total catch? Because if you take 25% of your reef away or 10% of the reef away, your instant calculation is there's 25% of your catch gone down straight away. Uh, so what, what about the long term? This is kind of um, sort of arm-waving data, but it took us about 30 years to collect it, um, so we'll talk about it. Um, at Sumilan Reserve, the longer you protect the reserve, the things that, people ca uh, things that uh, people really like to target in the fisheries go up. Uh, the bottom column, the bottom graph, sorry, is the actual catch outside the, the, um, the, the uh, reserve over uh, that period. Uh, and as you longer you protect the uh, reserve, the higher the catch went. Um, outside the reserve, I, I stress. At Apo, a similar sort of pattern, more biomass inside the reserve, um, but um, a bit more of a flat curve. The most conservative interpretation of that is that the yield and catch sure as heck didn't go down. Uh, so other things uh, that might benefit, you might uh, gain from benefiting from a marine reserve such as tourism uh, are, are certainly a, a real win. Now I'm going to, I never thought I'd say this, but I tried to rip through the biology and fisheries stuff, the boring stuff, and get through the really interesting stuff, the social science and politics, um, which is completely out of my field. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how they actually set these things up, because it's the crux of the story. The story starts actually in 1973 with um, uh, Simulon Island, and this was the first community-based marine conservation and education program uh, set up at Simulon Island. It was set up by Angel Alcala. He started the process, and the process was very simple. I described part of it last night. You would go into the, the, uh, the local community and start talking to them about their problems. What are your problems? Um, worried about uh, whether our kids are going to have fish to catch. Um, what is the big problem? Well, uh, you know, we're really worried about all these commercial fishing operations or these Muro army operations. There's nothing to stop them coming and fishing in front of our village, um, and we can't do anything about it. Um, well, perhaps you could do something about it. Uh, uh, what could we do? So the, 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 the sort of discussions went back and forth and Angel got into the sort of social preparation, community organisation, environmental education, showing them life cycles of corals, life cycles of fishes, and finally community empowerment, convincing them they could actually do something about that, that scenario that I described of, um, of everything was controlled in Manila, you know, five or 600 kilometres away or more, and these people couldn't do anything about what was happening on their own reef. Um, now, the story is really interesting at Apo, the other um, place we stayed because uh, worked on uh, for quite a long time. Um, the initial um, um, uh, mechanism to, to sort of control the, the, um, the reef was essentially setting up a police station with two, uh, two policemen with armalite rifles, basically, to try and keep uh, the illegal fishers off, or, or what was not illegal at the time, but they were commercial fishing because many of those were armed as well. And so it was a fairly interesting time back in the 70s and 80s. Eventually, uh, the community started to um, 
um, take a real ownership of what was going on. They set up their own marine management plan. They set up local legislation at the municipality level. Um, um, I won't go through the actual management plan, but they did things like they built a, a, a marine management centre that's in, being constructed in 1990. Um, and they literally uh, took control of uh, um, monitoring um, the reef, setting up a sanctuary and setting up a management plan around the whole island. Um, the thing I, I stand in enormous wonder about this and, uh, is that um, the way Angel did it and still does it is that although the scientists and social scientists go into the community and start talking to people, when it gets to this stage, it, gets, it was always the idea of the community themselves. Okay? And, and that's the key. It was, it's, it's the ownership, it's the stewardship that many people have actually talked about and it's the key to what makes it work. These days, if you go to Apo Island, and I recommend you do, uh, it's the sort of poster child of community-based marine management on uh, coral reefs and perhaps worldwide. Um, got two wonderful uh, resorts on it. If you go there, I recommend Liberty's Resort because uh, I've known her for so long. She's um, married to the local mayor uh, uh, and he was... Uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, her brother is the local mayor and he's uh, actually a, a trained uh, um, dive master and done his dive master on the Gold Coast. So there's, uh, there's, there's links to Queensland. Um, what I wanted to say is, is it is an incredible success story. Um, they take in nearly 100,000 US dollars in tourism income into a community of 800 people annually, plus another $35,000 in dive fees. Um, and it's a, a wonderful story. Um, this is the local school. Um, my, my rather poetic little line on this one is that these kids have never known a world without a marine reserve on their doorstep. Poetic, I know, uh, but it really does emphasise the intergenerational um, way that this thing can keep going. But once these kids realise that this is the way uh, the world is, they'll probably keep doing it. Uh, how do we do it these days? Very quickly, um, we um, training uh, and putting social um, social scientists and, and using community organisers, putting them into the community, setting up alternative livelihoods, getting people out of fishing, and uh, believe it or not. Family planning, oh, it's actually called women's health in the Philippines, you're not allowed to say family planning, but um, it, it's the sort of things that the really basic uh, level. Um, now, this is the map of the Bahol Sea these days, that's Samilan and Apo, the two little reserves that I talked about. Uh, we now have um, on that map 65 uh, no-take reserves, all small, all community-based, uh, relatively small ones. Um, but it has led to an extraordinary expansion of this, 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 te this technique, I guess, of, of marine management, um, both uh, r across the Bahol Sea and uh, nationally in the last two decades. Um, and the, the key to this story really is that um, um, in 1991, the Philippines passed a law called the Local Government Code, which was strengthened by a thing called the Fisheries Code in 1998. And that gave uh, the coastal municipalities uh, in the Philippines, all the yellow bits on that map, uh, uh, authority to co-manage their marine resources at 15 kilometres with the national government. Um, and uh, that's a, a major watershed in the way they, they, they manage marine resources. If you think I'm sort of uh, drawing a fairly long straw and suggesting that just Samilan and Apo were the starting points for that, this man here, Angel Alcala, not only started those, but he um, was also the Minister for the Department of Environment and Natural Resources for, for about four years and then sat in, and sat in Cabinet under two different presidents for six years. So, in other words, uh, I remember, I don't know if Russell's in the room, but Russell and a few others have talked about people with scientists connecting to managers, connecting to policy, connecting to legislation. Uh, this guy has done it the whole lot himself and he's an, an amazing individual. Um, Again, a bit of po poetry from Dr. Russ. Um, when people talk about people power, I, I remember the, the Philippine Revolution, that uh, uh, literally the, the bloodless, bloodless revolution that got rid of Marcos after 17 years of martial law. Um, and in a sense, um, what we're talking about here is, is a, a bit of power devolving back to the people again. It's a nice... Um, just quickly to try and broaden this before I, I, I conclude... Um, this idea of de devolving fisheries management responsibility down to, to local levels. Um, done a very similar thing, Juan Carlos Castilla, uh, one of my Pew Fellow colleagues, has done, had a very similar experience in Chile using MPAs, no take zones in, into tidal ones. Um, when we got the Pew Fellowship um, and we ran into Tony Charles, a, a social scientist at Nova Scotia in Canada, he came up to us and said, I've he was working on the, um, the um, 
fishing uh, communities and the collapses in, in Canada and Nova Scotia and, and uh, Newfoundland came up to us and said, I've really got to talk to you guys about getting fishing communities uh, involved in the management process. You want to talk to us? You know, it's the largest fishery collapses on the, in the planet and they, uh, they're trying to devolve some responsibility down to the local fishing communities. Um, uh, Josh, I think Josh is in the room. I've talked to Josh a few times about this. A similar thing uh, has happened uh, in Kenya. If you ask me what was the best managed fishery in the world, I'd probably say these days the black lip abalone fishery. And if you ask Jeremy Prince what would be a better way to manage that, he will tell you that it's actually getting local, smaller management groups and the fishermen involved in those smaller management groups in the management process. Um, very quickly, and this is thanks to the ARC Centre of Excellence, we're looking at biogeography, genetics across the, uh, of fish and corals across the whole sea. We're looking at connectivity models, trying to improve the reserve network. Expanding it just a, just a touch, um, this is a map of 478 of these MPAs. Jonesy just had a slide there saying he wasn't quite sure what the count was, and I, not, I am, I'm not either. Um, and uh, we're looking at that. We have data sets for fish and corals. We're going to try and improve the, the, the network as, as well as we can across the entire Philippines. Um, I'm, I'm concluding. APO and Similan were, were very uh, influential. They, that was the starting point um, in, in the story. They did demonstrate that these things could um, play a really key role in, in diversity conservation, biodiversity conservation and fisheries management. They expanded the network of, of no-take reserves quite dramatically. Um, but most importantly, they, they, there was a bit of a watershed in the way they, they, they um, changed the management policy of marine resources across the entire country. And in a, in a, in a nice sort of way, they, um, they in a sense gave some power back to the people down at the beach who uh, really depended on the resources. Thank you. Thank you.